Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I see that people are joining. Um, I'm chairing today as our friend Zachary Wright had um, some emergency. So I will chair today and um, I will start after welcoming all of you and thanking once again uh, Professor Khan and uh, Harvard for putting together this program. I think yesterday it was a very dense day and we all learned a lot and enjoyed um, uh, the presentations. Uh, let me start by reading the biographies of uh, the three speakers for today. Um, thereafter, um, you will start I think the order should be Khalid Ajmain first. Uh, could you please uh, confirm just with a nod of your, yeah, thanks. Um, so Hail Chitra second. Sheikh Abdullahi Nyang should be the third. And Rasul Miller should be the fourth, the fourth. So we have four presenters. I'll start by reading the biographies. Khalid Ajmain is a graduate of the School of Audio Engineering in Singapore. He has several years of professional experience in audio production, as well as event management. He was the director of Straits Records between 98 and 2002, where he was involved in the production and promotion of the albums of several local bands. Prior to that, he worked as a graphic designer for Elliott Records in France. Away from his professional work, Khalid was also involved in humanitarian work in Aceh, Jogjakarta, East Timor and Africa, delivering aid to countries hit by natural disasters and poverty. He is socially active in volunteer work and was a befriender at Darul Arkham Converts Association in the past. Thanks for joining this conference, Khalid. Khalid has studied in a peasant train in, in his, his Islamic school in Solo, Indonesia for about a year. He studied from Habib Saleh al jufri Habib Ali al jufri Kiai Saleh Masrur, and Ustaz Ramli, amongst others. He also had the privilege of learning with some of the respected scholars for several years. In 2010, he took the Tariqa Tijaniya from Sheikh Fakhruddin Uwaisi from South Africa, who is a Muqaddam of Sheikh Hassan Sisi and Sheikh Mahi Sisi, before he renewed his Tariq al-Jaza with Sheikh Mahi Sisse when the Sheikh traveled to Singapore. Khalid is the founder of Saud Ilahi. He is the main man behind several projects initiated by Saud Ilahi. Among the recent projects is the publishing of the book Islam, the Religion of Peace, which he launched in London along with Sheikh Tijan Sisse. Um, okay, the second speaker uh, will be, and thanks Khalid for, for joining the conference, mashallah. The second speaker will be Sohail Chitra, who is a Tijani Muqaddam in the Zawiya of Kerala. He holds a master's in business administration, University of Calicut, Kerala, and a degree in mechanical engineer, engineering, University of Calicut, Kerala. Our third speaker, thanks for joining Suhail. Our third speaker will be Sheikh Abdullah Nyang, who received a PhD in social and cultural anthropology and was trained at the University Sheikh Anta Diop of Dakar and at the University of Toulouse Jean Jaurès in France at the Center of Social and Historical Anthropology. He defended his doctoral thesis on the links between transnational expansion and the struggle for recognition within the Fayda Tijaniya. His teaching activities began at the University of Toulouse, where he was a lecturer for several, several years. Later, he joined the Department of Sociology at the University of Dakar and the Virtual University of Senegal as associate professor. He is the author of several publications and papers on religious dynamics in West Africa. His book, Transnational Itinerancy and National Recognition, which is devoted to the Fayda Tijaniya, is currently being published by Armatan Editions, Paris. We look forward, uh, Sheikh Abdullahi, for this publication. Currently a researcher at the IFAN, Sheikh Anta Diop Laboratory of Cultural Anthropology, 
His research interest has recently broadened to the issue of solidarity economy and community development in relation to religious communities and associations in Senegal. Thanks for joining our conference, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullahi Nyang. Um, the, our fourth speaker will be Rasul Miller, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of California. Rasul received his PhD in history and Africana studies from the University of Pennsylvania and his BA in economics and African and, Af and African American studies from Duke University. During the academic year 2019-2020, he served as a postdoctoral associate in the study of the racialization of Islam at Yale University Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. His research interests include Black Muslim communities in the Atlantic world, Black radicalism and its impact on social and cultural movements in the 20th centuries, century US, Black internationalism and West African Islamic intellectual history. His current book project is Black Muslim Cosmopolitanism, the global character of New York City's Black Muslim movement. It examines the Black internationalist origins of early 20th century Black Sunni Muslim congregations in and around New York City and the cultural and political orientations that characterized subsequent communities of Black Muslims in the US. Thanks for joining, Rasul. Um, okay, I see that, uh, that uh, there's now more people who have joined in in the meantime. So without further ado, I would like to ask our first speaker, Khalid Ajmain to um, share his screen if he needs to share something or to just uh, start his presentation. Uh, Bismillah. Thank you, Professor. We have about 20 minutes. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. We pray that all of you are in good health. Uh, we just break our fast and our, inshallah, and thank you to Professor Usman Ken for inviting me. Uh, into this conference, uh, inshallah. Um, I, I will be sharing today uh, the journey of the Tarika Tijania through Faida uh, in Singapore. But before that, uh, uh, give you a, a, a bit of the history of our region, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Nusantara, they call it, right? Uh, Southeast Asia, Islam has uh, arrived in reach in our region since 13th century. And it has been all along with the Sufis and the Aulia. Although many of them, uh, not only as a teacher or missionary or even uh, a scholar, some, some of them or many of them actually are traders, uh, Sufi traders that came to our region. So we have a huge uh, history uh, in Southeast Asia on Sufism and Sufi path, right? Uh, but I'm going to start first into Indonesia because uh, they, uh, Indonesia has a long history in Tijania. And later on, I will reconnect uh, with Malaysia and Singapore. And later on, I bring you straight to Singapore, inshallah. So uh, Tijani in Indonesia uh, arrived uh, in 1912, right? And it through this Sheikh uh, Ali Taib from Medina. And what is interesting is that uh, it is the, almost the same year that the Tarika Tijania arrived in Malaysia, but from the Sheikh of Said, Said Ali Taib, right? And Said Ali Taib, uh, based on Sheikh Fakhruddin, uh, when I was asking him some questions about the history in Indonesia, because he went there twice, and he said that uh, Sheikh Said Ali Taib, right? Uh, when he returned from Indonesia to Medina uh, in Mecca, uh, he took or tajdid with Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. And, uh, a lot, but a lot of Indonesian doesn't know that, right? Because he left Indonesia. Although he left his children, or his family in Indonesia. Uh, so when Sheikh Fakhruddin went to Indonesia, he, he informed about, about it, right? So, in Malaysia, uh, the Tarika arrived from the Sheikh from Indonesia also, from Java, because 
at that point of time, uh, they were very popular with different tarika, right? And uh, one of the things that is very popular is all the kadri and then Lakshbandi and uh, Rifai and Khalawati. So this Sheikh who came to Malaysia from Java, his name is he's known as Sheikh Banten, right? And he went to Mecca to continue his study. And when he went to, to Mecca to continue his study, that's how he met Sheikh Alpha Hashim, who is the teacher or the Sheikh that gave Sheikh Said Ali Taib the Tariqah. And the Sheikh Banten or, or Sheikh Pert Banten, right, uh, he came back, he went to Malaysia and he started the Tariqah there. Right, and one of his murid, right, is the current prime minister of Malaysia, father, right, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Yassin bin Muhammad. But uh, the tariqah, of course, in Indonesia, they were spread uh, variously to many of the state, even beyond Jawa. Jawa. The famous seven Mukaddam or Sheikh Ali Taib. Right, they cover the whole Jawa. Jawa is, I think, for those who may not uh, know well about Java in Indonesia, it is uh, twice as uh, Malaysia. It, that's how big it is. They have the West and they have the East and they have the Central Java, right? And throughout this whole uh, historical uh, record that I learned from all those Tijani in both countries, there is no trace or details about Tarika Tijani in Singapore at all at that point of time, right? And in fact, in Singapore, we were very popularized with different Tarika, right? And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, it goes a long way, but people still do not know if there is any uh, details of any Tarika Tijani in Singapore, until Shemahi came, right? And that's why I'm getting it into. So Singapore history or Sufism are many, uh, are very long time also, since 13th century. And and we have a famous uh, saint named Habib No Al-Habshi, right? the descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's a Tariqah Naqshbandi, that's what we've been known. And uh, the interesting part was that, um, uh, we are so custom, right? so used to Habib No, uh, because he has a lot of karma, a lot of miracles during his lifetime and after his death. Uh, his makam was supposed to be moved uh, away from the exact location, but because of his karma, his miracle as awliya, uh, they were not, they were unable to to remove it for development, so it stay. So since young, uh, me and a lot of people of my generations, we are so used to that sort of uh, tariqah. That means tabaruk and also sort of ziarah, awliya, and, and, and so on. And that's why I, I, I felt that uh, the strong influence of such tariqah remain throughout times, right? Even though uh, in the earlier days, uh, the earlier times in 1912, the same timing as I mentioned about the history of uh, Tijani in Indonesia and uh, in Malaysia, uh, in Singapore, we have the dominant of Tarika Ahmadi Idrisya and also the Tarika Kadria. And they have their own prominent period of time, right? So we still do not have a, a Tijani uh, until Shemahi came. And that's what we know, and that's what we have checked so many times, right? So what happened was that uh, in 2010, 2008, I think, uh, that my wife actually uh, looked into the Tarika Tijani website, tijani.org, and Professor Zachary Wright and uh, some of the American Murids, uh, Sheikh Hassan, uh, make that website. And when she looked into the website, uh, she was very impressed. And she, she, she liked it and she contacted uh, 
the 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 organization and then uh, Haji Ashaki who is a lady mukaddam of Sheikh Hasan at that time replied and had uh, email correspondent with my wife and later on uh, she decided to take the tar tarika at that time i didn't know uh, anything about it until she told me but before that i already know about tarika tijani uh, through Warda books because of uh, Professor Zakiri Wright's book on the path of the Prophet wasallam. It enticed me, but we we still do not know how to to go about and where to go about uh, because we are still used to, you know, the usual tarika and so on. Not until I hosted Sheikh Fakhruddin when he wanted to visit uh, Indonesia. So he transited in Singapore for three days. And that's how I begin to learn more about the tarika, and that's where we get to know about like there's no ziara makam of the aulia of non tijani, uh, there's no mixing of aurat, there's no you know asking for spiritual support for uh, any living she or non living she if it's non tijani. So, but at that point of time, it's, it's very difficult for Singaporean because we are so used or we are customized since young, uh, tabaruk, you know, the, 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 the way of just seek baraka in Tasawf, like visit the awliya that I mentioned, like Habib No. And we in Singapore, according to one of the local we start here, we have 112 makam of awliya in Singapore in a small island. We are actually an island. Right. We are very small. For one end to one end is like uh, maybe two hours. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So we have 112. So the sacred legacy is always there in the sense of we follow it as a spiritual culture. And But of course, uh, later on, we realize uh, for those who, like me, seeking uh, to to, to dive deeper, we always explore the other the other options of what is there and all that. And Warda Books has been a platform for me, right? Because in Warda Books, they, they sell all kinds of uh, Sufism book, even history and all that. And that's how I discover about African Sufism. And I'm always enticed with African Sufism, although I do not know who get in touch but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make my wife as a means to to connect it and that's where when I finally I mean we had I had a lot of discussion with Sheikh Fakhruddin on this matter we, even when he left Singapore and because of Facebook alhamdulillah we get to connect and finally alhamdulillah uh, Sheikh Fakhruddin uh, ever said to me it's like you worried that you cannot visit a makam of awliya rather than you want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that removed me, actually, from uh, the whole mental thing, I would say. So I decided to take from him. And then I told my wife, and we were so happy. And uh, we didn't plan it at all. So, and, we, and we both realized that we took the Tariqa Tijani, and that's why we planned to bring Shema Hisise. Because Haji Ashaki was telling my wife that, you know, your she is... Shemahi. And that's how uh, she got the number. We contacted uh, Shemahi. At that time, he was in Umrah and he said, yes, he will come. And we were doing a conference on Islamic spirituality, Sufism. But we were looking at the different angle. Rather than talking about Tarika, we were talking about the essence of Sufism. So Shemahi was the keynote speaker at that time. So that was the opening for us in Singapore, uh, in Tijaniya. Right. And Shemahi mentioned about uh, a lot of stuff on the tarika itself. Uh, but other than that, it's all related to the condition of Singapore, which is a very stressful life, high cost of living. And that's how uh, you open up a bit. I remember his first lecture was on, <clears throat> his first lecture was only 30 people. That was the first wazifa we, we, we had together with him. And none of us, uh, many of us do not know how to read that wazifa. So Shemahi is the one who read everything for us and with his assistant, uh, his name is Tijani also. 
So after that, alhamdulillah, uh, it start to open up, and that's where we started to to bring uh, Sheikh Fakhruddin again. And this time he taught us Ruhul Adab completely. He was with us, I think, around 10 days. And every day we had that session. And then we had Professor Zachary Wright coming and he brought for us uh, pearls of the divine flood. And then we have Imam Abdullah from Michigan, who is also a Mukaddam of Sheikh Hassan. He came and we have quite numbers of uh, Mukaddam and, and, and Sheikh that came later on after Sheikh Mahi. Alhamdulillah. And when Shimahi was here, we, we brought him to meet uh, Habib Hassan, who is the who is the Imam of Masjid Ba'alawi and also a prominent scholar in Singapore. And we also brought him to meet uh, Ustaz Hassan, uh, Ustaz Hasbi Hassan, who is the president of the Singapore Ulama Council. And uh, it was for Shiratul Rahim, is to forge uh, uh, brotherhood and interestingly Habib Hassan also share about uh, his experience and he was so happy to meet Sheikh Mahi that he read Salah Fatih to Sheikh Mahi and he said that his father went to Zira Sheikh Ahmad Tijani in Fez and so on but that was also an opening because our local ulama accepted it and embraced it and find the beauty of, of, of the path right so the, the, the beginning part is a little bit difficult for us because, as I mentioned, we are, we, we are used to different types of Sufism, different types of way people locally see Sufism because it's the, the, the condition of uh, in Tijani and all that, a lot of people feel they, they, they do not want this kind of tariqa because it's too serious and uh, or you cannot do anything else or you cannot join anything else and all that. But alhamdulillah, we still proceed on. So when Sheikh Mahi first left Singapore, the, after the conference, there were seven of us. There are seven of us who took the tariqa. Me and my wife, we renewed our baya or our ijaza with Sheikh Mahi. But there are five of them who took the tariqa with him. So we started with seven and we were doing that Hailala and Wazifa which Sheikh Mahi asked me to do at Warda Books because the owner of the Warda Books took the tariqa also from Sheikh, uh, from Sheikh Mahi. And later on we have uh, Ben Omar. I think all of you know Ben Omar. And uh, he came a year later and few of them also took from him. And later on as I said Sheikh Fakhruddin and all that. But I think also one of the major points is that when my wife uh, and me, we went to Medina Bay first time, uh, after three years, we know Sheikh Mahi, finally we are able to ziarah Medina Bay, mashallah. But the first one to, re to reach uh, uh, Medina Bay was a brother Ashik who hosted Sheikh Mahi and who was the last one to took the tariqa before Sheikh Mahi left for the first time that he came. Right, he he attended in during the Maulud time, and we came later on. Uh, I think a, a week or two after that. So I'm glad that was uh, a beautiful change in our life. First time, and we never thought that we would step foot in West Africa. It's like you know you can't believe it, and the whole beautiful spiritual culture of Madina Bay changed our life too. Right, the way the wazifa and everything, mashallah, the daily routine with Shemahi. Inshallah, it changed how we see things. And before we left, Sheikh Mahim made me and my wife as Mukaddam. And she said that whoever wants to take the tariqa, you just give them and guide them and so on. And at the same time, he also said that, right, uh, Allah is closer to you in Senegal, is also closer to you in Singapore. Madina Bay is always with you, uh, wherever you are. So when we came back to, to Singapore, uh, that was another turning point because it changes a lot of uh, the landmark of it because we never thought that this is something that we will experience. And through our work uh, at South Ilahi, we always do conferences on Sufism and all that. A lot of young people, uh, they, they see this as a means for them to go through uh, life challenges and understand their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Right? And that's how a lot of young people started to started to join us and started to do to 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 be in the wazifa and even those in the subculture uh, that you don't you can't imagine that they will be in the wazifa they came forward like those who are into the punk music ex convict the skinhead and so on so he was a bit uh, uh, it was really uh, mesmerizing for for me when i look back at those years of journey right and along the way we learned the uh, recital you know the letters of she uh, ibrahim nas from uh, imam uh, imam abdul andau and we started to read the maulud tahniyatul rabi in singapore and uh, we we read more and more and she may give us a lot of uh, encouragement and 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 to see that and it totally changed totally changed how people see it right so young people today in singapore they look at the tarika differently because for many of them they do not have uh, like a baggage or you know like you hold you want to your spiritual culture kind of thing but because they want allah and they looking for something that can help them preserve them in this high cost of living stress and that's how they begin to realize uh, the need of tariqa so we don't have uh, uh, Khalid, um you have about 2 minutes can i ask okay. you to move towards yeah. the conclusion yeah so yeah uh, and i can see that a lot of young people in singapore mashallah they 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 really look into tariqa tijani as a means uh, of knowing allah through their difficulty right and even when we were in the tijani conference in fes uh, i think 5 years ago uh, all of them were saying that your shabab because i think we were the youngest contingent at that time right the youngest that i had given tarika is around 15 years old and i think the oldest we had is dr tahir he's a doctor uh, he's 75 but the rest are all below 35 and they are all below 20 years old So alhamdulillah uh, I wish I could mention a lot more but I know time is limited uh, and uh, I hope you can uh, anything you can ask me inshallah I try to uh, but of course later on we have uh, other shuyu from the Tijani murids and mukaddam kirim like Sheikh Abdul Khairi and few more yeah but alhamdulillah we thank Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing and thank you prof for hosting assalamualaikum Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting insider's view. Um, and so um, I, I would suggest that as the first two presentations today uh, touch on similar histories from two Asian countries, I would suggest that we have a very short question, question and answer session after the two first presentations. And then we listen to the second slot of two speakers. Um, so our second presenter, uh, whose uh, biography I had uh, read uh, before, is Suhail Chitra, who will present on the history of the Faida Tijaniya in Kerala, India. So, Bismillah. Oh, can I present my screen? So, um, uh, due to fear of uh, missing important portions i skip the introduction part and i actually move to the core portion of my study okay here we go um uh, let us uh, talk about um tijaniya and kerala before the formal introduction of tijaniya in the form of baya uh, first of all uh, the prominent personality to have talked about uh, uh, the jani sheikh is sheikh sihabuddin ahmed qai shaliati who was renowned a scholar in kerala famous for his expertise in four schools of thought uh, he he studied under extraordinary scholar from india imam ahmed raza khan baralbi uh, he is uh, he occupied crucial positions in samasta kerala jamiat ulama which is the principal scholarly body of sunni shafi community in kerala He, his library is very famous for rare manuscripts and rich collection of you know, collection of islamic works his collection of fatwas are very famous 
in one of the fatwas defending gathering of dhikr he quotes shaykh umar al futi and his works from uh, work of imam in another passage uh, when someone questioned uh, allama shaliyati whether seeking a shaykh is obligatory or not he said it is not obligatory but it is necessary when we think in the standpoint of discernment to pass uh, to support this argument he quotes kitab rima of shaykh umar al futi who rather quotes shaykh ali arazim's jawahir al maani who narrates from his shaykh shaykh ahmad tijani in another pass, uh, passage he says this reporter from uh, shaykh umar al futi it is dangerous to take a position of shaykhood without the permission of complete shaykh if one does so his end will be very bad if he does not report, repent on that he will die as an infidel fata was hariya another important prominent personality to have talked about uh, uh, to have some connection to sayyidna shah ahmad tijani before uh, the former interest of tijani is pangil ahmad kutu musliyar who was an erudite scholar from kerala who held the prestigious post of second president of samasta kerala jamiatul ulama he had a stu- student named palathingara rahmad ramadan sheikh it is reported that from oral sources that he had with some he had with him some sanad uh, some chain of transmission given by his sheikh which was connected to sayyidna shah ahmad tijani another prominent uh, figure is professor ali kutti musliyar who is pr- present general secretary of samasta kerala jamiatul ulama he studied under sayyid muhammad ali maliki makkah in 1980s under maliki's tutelage uh, he came in contact with various tijani masters from africa he also had close connection with many grandchildren of sayyidna shah ahmad tijani though he had take he, he didn't take tariqa from them he took some adhkars of baraka and considered tijani tariqa and its masters in high esteem now uh, here in this picture i have depicted the uh, maqam of uh, imam shaliyati and pangil uh, ahmad kutub musliyat this is uh, uh, sheikh ali kutub musliyat and he is welcoming uh, uh muqaddam of um, sheikh al hayri in kerala now we'll skip to the major part a peculiarity and features of tasawuf of practice in kerala which is very relevant when connected to the jani tariqa and its influence first of all uh, tasawuf of practice in kerala uh, stress more on sharia and spiritual exercises um it uh, the tasawuf in kerala wa, 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 was more ghazalian than shadulian Uh, we quote hidayat al adkiya ila tariq al awliya written by sheikh muhammedin mahdi mahdi qanani where he says awali kulli wahid at tariq min tariq yakhtaruhu fa yakun min zawasila ka julusihi bayna al anami murabbiyan wa ka kasrat al awrad ka sawm wa sala wa ka hidmat lil nas wal hamd wal hatab bi tasadduq bi muhassal mutaamala which translate which can be translated as among the many tariqa available each one selects his own tariqa and thus he reaches the goal through that tariqa like sitting at the source of the people as educator increasing the number of vird accustomed was such as fasting and prayer and like service of people loading goods so he can earn money and give give in charity from these lines it is obvious that the emphasis on mujahada spiritual exercises uh was the path of the sufis in kerala the shadulian approach built on ma- uh, emphasis on marifa is rarely seen in the kerala tasawuf another major text uh on the subject of tasawuf came from the yemenite sayyid settled in kerala sayyid muhammad al jifri his book kanzal barahin considered adherence to tasawuf suited mostly to scholars he quotes perfect sufi should fully obey the words of prophet and should also be a good scholar well versed in religious sciences and honest and dependable man tijaniya tasawuf um tijaniya tasawuf focuses more on grace and fadl of allah and is more shadrian than ghazali a murid reciting very less zikr and gaining great benefits is far from the idea of tasawuf in kerala so fi some kerala a murid should attain spiritual ranks through constant zikr lack of sleep food and uh, complete focus on controlling the self in kerala it is said that a sufi is a person who should avoid even the karahat of sharia if a common person is found taking any any tariqa he is questions whether he he is questioned whether he is engaged in any actions which is not advisable if he is if so his acquaintance with tariqa is discouraged tijani tariqa is given to uh, if if tijani tariqa is given to any common man who is ready to obey the condition of tariqa and will try maximum to obey the rules of sharia uh karahat happening from his hand will not be reason to remove him from the tariqa this idea is less encouraged in kerala tasawuf 
uh, next feature is entry to tariqa is restricted to those people uh, who complete their sharia as quoted court, uh, from uh, book of tariqa written by panmala abdul qadir muslier in other another passage he says therefore a muri should take all things which is obligatory therefore a muri should take all things which is which are obligatory and leave all things which are prohibited in sharia apart from this a muri should be scrupulous he should take all recommended actions in actions in tariq uh, in sharia and leave all things which are karahat uh, not recommended he should also leave things which he does not need from the permitted things common people are not bound to take tariqa nurisha tariqa is attacked for this reason they are given tariqa to common uh, they are giving tariqa to common people who don't follow the strict rules of sharia in the form mentioned earlier without any conditions sharia is only thing mandatory for every mature individual tariqa and haqeeqat are for special people therefore sharia is common platform in kerala in kerala the tasawuf concentrates more on tazkiyah uh, very less attention is given to tarbiyah of knowing allah which focus on exposing oneself to the knowledge of allah and knowing him in all the opposites knowledge of allah is rare in the literature and methodology of sufi practices in kerala so a tariqa concentrated on marifa is less accepted by the scholars and common as like another bottom feature is sheikh should give tarbiyah only in secret Kerala ulama does not negate the possibility of Sheikh Hatter being in our times, but they opine that such a Sheikh will be either hiding or will give Tarbiya, he will not give Tarbiya in general. For example, Parma Adil Kaldar Musliya says, there is no doubt or difference of opinion that Kutub Zaman, Mambaram Sayyid Alivi Thangal is a Sheikh Al-Murabi. However, in front of common people, he didn't exhibit any qualification of Sheikh Hatter Biya. He didn't give by a buy of Tarbiya to any common people. Middle, midst of common people, he was like a normal uh, Sharia scholar who taught from Sharia matters. For qualified people, he transmitted the Quran of Tabarruk. Along with that, uh, along with that, uh, in secret, he acted as a Sheikh Tarbiya towards selected few people. Uh, Nur Shah, uh, uh, in another passage, he, he says, Nur Shah claims to be Sheikh Tarbiya. This is against the teachings of true scholars and Mashaikh because. In one opinion, Tarbiya ceased to exist after Hijra 9th century. In another opinion, Tarbiya will happen on, uh, until doomsday. However, due to the increase in ruin and surge in fake uh, tariqats, after 19, 9th century, Sheikhs of Tarbiya will not do open Tarbiya, but will do it in secret only for those selected qualified uh, for the same. According to these two opinions, Nusha Tariqat cannot be a true Murabi. In this contest, the arrival of Tijani Tariqa claim to be the tariqa of tarbiya alone and giving the buyer to all who are ready to obey the conditions of tarbiya had stirred many problems among the ulama they cannot accept the tariqa of this sort another another important feature is giving importance to the of tarbiya or recommended the um, transmitted in the hadith uh, ulama of kerala ulama of kerala give more importance to the recommended the transmitted in the hadith over the dhikr of tariqa or tarbiya they advise to do dhikr of tariqa only after the completion of recommended dhikr in sharia it um, it is um, it is uh, in, in a refutation and targeted on abdul abdul musriya patikar and his tariqa parman abdul qadir musriya says his tariqa considered the dhikr given uh, given by sheikh loftier than the dhikr transmitted in the hadith if sheikh gives us a dhikr it, it be, will become Uh, obligatory for the murid to recite that. Therefore, they claim that the dhikr of Sheikh is obligatory and other dhikrs are recommended. They claim that even the person's person leave Haddad Ratib or Vardul Latif, murid should not leave the dhikr given by his Sheikh. This is not different in the Tijani Tariqa. A murid considered, considers Vardul Lazim, Wadifa and Hailala over all other recommended dhikr in Sharia. This is also unacceptable for the scholars in Kerala. Next major part is the Qadri influence. In, the, in in kerala sheikh abdul qadir jilani is considered supreme saint and he, and his tariqa is considered the best tariqa by the people of kerala due to uh, the influence of qadri uh, qadri tariqa in kerala all the all other tariqa which came into kerala claimed allegiance with qadri tariqa for example balavi aidurusi tariqa which came from yemen had no direct connection with qadri tariqa but in uh, but it was famous in kerala in the name of tariqa tul qadriya tul aidurusi walalawiya Purati Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, though a Sheikh of Sohravardiya, was given the name after Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Even the Shaduli path practiced by the Sufis in Kerala is found to be mixed with Qadri. Some of 
the name uh, some uh, some of them named the tariqa as qadriyatu shadiliya many shadilis recite kutubiyat which is uh, calling on shah abdul qadir jilani for madad along with the shadili ratib in akbariya in, in the akbariya order of shah ibn arabi though had very less accept, acceptance in kerala is also found mixed with qadri path even the chistiya of shah uh, aminuddin chisti uh, is found uh, mixed with qadriya Uh, Mohidin Mala played a great role in positioning Sheikh Jilani in um, minds of commoners. Mohidin Mala is this is by hearted and recited by all uh, Sunni homes in Kerala. There is a custom uh, of the brides being visited by elder ladies of the groom's house before her betrothal. On being questioned for her of her education, the girl was expected to say that she has learned the Quran and Mohidin Mala. Mohidin Mala com- comprises of two parts. Uh, first part is eulogy of sheikh uh, uh, sheikh jilani and the last part is uh, istighatha uh, seeking help on sheikh jilani and next major thing is kutubiyat a ritual seeking help uh, from sheikh uh, sheikh jilani thousand times uh, written and composed by sheikh sadaqatullah al qahiri of tamil nadu india gained great popularity in kerala most of the houses and mosques con- uh, conducted ma- monthly gatherings of kutubiyat recitation of mohidin mala and monthly gatherings of kutubiyat is part of the routine of sunnis in kerala balavi wadifa named haddad ratib were popularized by yemeni sayyids in kerala and is recited every sunni mosque after isha prayers haddad ratib is followed by recitation of fatiha on saints like sheikh jilani sheikh rifai mambratangal etc seen since most of the sufi adherents were were part of thai stage of sufism Uh, most of the sunni community made it as a habit to visit various dead saints and martyrs for blessings and help even the ex- excursions conducted by religious institutions uh, were to visit uh, various saints for blessings in various parts of the country to this circumstance when the tijani tariqa came into popularity it invited great resistance from scholars and commoners alike firstly the basic edu- uh, condition of tijani tariqa prohibits seeking blessings from non tijani saints this means they have to stop recitation of mohidin mala adadrati kutubiyat etc they also have to stop with uh, visiting other awliya for blessings this was very heavy on commoners and commoners and scholars alike to adapt to tijani way of doing things were found very tough for new entrants to be tariqa scholars who work uh, worked in mosques as mudarris and muazzin will lose their job if they stay away from these rituals it created great tension among the scholars who were attracted to the tijani path many of the rituals mentioned above were, were systematically practiced on the banner of religious organizations so if a member took tijani tariqa it will be evident to others because he has to stay away from these activities this arose pressure from the organizations to islamic scholars to give verdict on tijani tariqa next is the uh, concept of khatmul wilaya which is unknown to the carlites they they cannot imagine a wali having a maqam higher than that of sheikh, uh, sheikh jilani tijani is considered Sheikh Ahmed Tijani as a supreme saint and essence of wilaya that means even Sheikh Jilani Sheikh uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani drank from his ocean this concept is considered alien by Kerala Sunnis if a person believes that there is a wali over uh, over the maqam of Sheikh Jilani he is considered to have brought a false belief and will be considered as an uh, will not be considered as a sun- true sunni the closest a sunni scholar in Kerala might have come to the concept of khatmul wilaya is by by learning about sheikh ibn arabi since the scholars think his teachings are not meant for commoners the concept of khatmul wilaya is also considered something of that sort another important uh, was, um, peculiarity is the kerala version of khan ka and zawiya the development of palidar system by the mahdums uh, had uh, has come from the adherence of qadri system which combined life of madrasas with that of khan ka life of madrasas mostly revolved around the learning islamic uh, lessons and life of khanka revolved around zikr and other spiritual practices palidars combined both uh, and uh, it seems that sambria Sa- sambia uh, has taken the place of zawiya sambia is a rural malabar is very small construction raised uh, either in the side of stream or tank or places far from the jamaat masjid these humble structures perhaps represent the zawiyas where mystics lived and prayed very often the sambia is raised by a single man or Or, or a family or, or for their own use sometimes a mullah may be teaching quran uh, to this uh, to the children after mari prayer in this place though the palis dar system is seen equivalent to the khanka sufi system the soul of it revolves around the qadi of the mosque 
Kali should be a person well trained in exoteric and esoteric sciences of Islam. He is also seen as a Sufi Sheikh. But in the modern Pali, this we see scholars who have no acquaintance with Sufism. They are people who take to, uh, take part only in the rituals. In that case, the whole system of Palidas does not serve as a Sufi Hanka. When Tijani Thoriyaka came into Kerala, Muris found it difficult to practice Wadifa in Hyderabad inside the Palidas system. In fact, they ex experienced strict, strict opposition from the Kalis of the mosque. Therefore, they were forced to shift their activities to temporary and permanent Zaviyas. A couple of Zaviyas are established in Kali, at Kali Ket, one in Malpuram district, another one, another two in uh, Kannur district. All these Zaviyas face problems from people of Mahal and committee nearby. Some of them attack the Zaviyas physically. Temporary Zaviyas were forced to change places due to problems from the nearby community. Now, I will go to um, major criticism on the Jan Tarika from Talit Solis. Sol we have um, about major... three minutes from now. Is that okay? Okay. 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 Mm. So these three scholars were the uh, major critics of uh, Tijani Torikam. First of all, Pormana Abdul Qadar Muslia. Uh, major criticism came from Pormana Abdul Qadar Muslia, who wrote a book named Torika, the comprehensive study to criticize many uh, Torika in Kerala. He left a chapter to criticize Tijani Torika also. Criticism falls into two categories. Criticism on Tijani Torika in general, criticism on, Aur on Aurada Tarbiya. He called it interview Tarbiya. He refers uh, highly to famous work of Sheikh uh, Ibn Maya by Ashigniti, Mustahal, Harif al Jani, Firadi, Dalakatya, Tijani al Jani. He begins his refutation by accepting the sainthood of Shah Matijani. He quotes Yusuf al Nabahani for the same, where Nabahani portrays Shah Matijani as a student of Ahmad Idris, which is historically wrong. Rather, he quotes on to say that the Tijani Torika in Kerala does not have any relationship with the true, true Tijani Torika of Shah Matijani. He then says that so called students of Shah Matijani did many interventions to teach. To the teachings of Shah Matijani, which was not really his. Jawaharul Ma'ani is a good example for it. He brings to the courts of Sheikh Muhammad al Haf the Mishri and Sheikh Ibrahim Rayahi to support to, the, to prove that Jawaharul Ma'ani had many teachings which are later invented by uh, his or, uh, so called students. Another critic is Sheikh, uh, Yasi Musliyar, uh, who uh, I am not going much into the details. I just wanted to uh, mention a name, Sheikh Mahmoud Fartavi. Uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Fartavi. Uh, is the key personality behind the spread of the Janitorika in Kerala. He studied um, uh, under his father. He is from the lineage of uh, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, and he is from the lineage of Sheikh Poratil uh, Abdul Qadir Thani, who is a great uh, Sohrawardi Sheikh. And he, he, he was in his young age. He was not at all a good student. He but when he went to Gulf countries at the age of 18, he developed the yearning to study, but he was unable to study. Towards the, uh, but uh, at that juncture, he had a dream which, which he had encountered uh, Imam Shafi. And after that, he had this passion to study that he could grasp, grasp everything what he was reading. And he continuously read a lot and by heart at everything. So he was also gifted a book, uh, Ibris, um, of Imam Lati, uh, Lamiti quoting Abdulaziz the Bagh. And he, after reading this book, he was fond to Sufism. And later on, he turned uh, towards Salawat and Salat al Nabi and, and formulated a lot of Salawat uh, in praising Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and spread uh, to everyone. And recent, uh, and his adherence to Tijani Tariqa came uh, when he, he was taken to uh, Sheikh Musa Abdullah of Sudan. And Sheikh Musa Abdullah of Sudan, um, uh, he requested Sheikh Musa um, Jawa, uh, the Ijaz of Jawahar Kamal. And Musa Abdullah directly gave him the Ijaz of Jawahar Kamal. And the Mudith was uh, astonished why he was giving the uh, Ijaz of, of Jawahar Kamal because, because it was uh, confined only to Tij uh, Tijanis. And uh, Sheikh Musa said, Jawahar, um, uh, I see the Tijani written on the forehead. That is why I have given him the Jaza. That day he dreamt Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in dream. And uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi instructed him to take the Tariqa. And that is how he took the Tariqa from Sheikh Musa. And later on, he uh, renewed it from Sheikh Sharif Ibrahim Sali al Husseini of Nigeria, who was a Muqaddam and uh, Khalifa of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias uh, I don't know whether I have more time, but I have a lot of materials pending to speak. I, was, uh, I also wanted okay, to mention yes. just, Ustad Rahmatullah You can Kasi. just name the main personalities and then we can, we can, we can close okay. it there. Uh, he, he's, uh, he is also another prominent figure. Then I was about to talk about uh, three Tijani, Zavi and Kerala, Zavi okay. Tijani in Kannur, Zavi Tufati in Kannur. And I also wanted to mention Tijani, Tijani in Kashmir and Hyderabad, and Aminuddin Uwaisi, brother of uh, Sheikh Fakhruddin Uwaisi. 
uh, I conducted him in Hyderabad and sister Rahila is also from Hyderabad and Sidi Harun is from from Kashmir and uh, okay that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, you have to rush if I understand correctly to the uh, Rukuma, so we'll not yes I will, you for the I will come back question and answer session we'll join the two question and answer sessions towards the end so you have a chance to go and uh, and uh, do your dhikr thank thanks a lot uh, i will come back after 50 minutes yeah yeah thank, no, you. No, thank, no. You, thank you thanks a lot to sahail for his presentation so two brief announcements for everyone uh, number one is that i'm sorry i had originally planned to have a, a short um, session for questions after the first two presentations because I saw a lot of connections between them. Here we have two fascinating stories of uh, recent spread uh, of the Faida Tijania in two Asian countries with one similarity in both of them very strongly Sufi context already before the arrival of uh, the Tijanis but also sharp differences. One seems to have been smooth the Singapore case and the second one, the Kerala case, seems to have raised a lot of oppositions by other Sufi orders that remind one of the early origins of the Tijania, the early beginnings of the Tijania in North Africa, especially in relations to Qadiri, um, sheikhs who contested the legitimacy of the Tijania. So I see that there's a lot of interesting questions possibly to ask here. Um, and that's why I wanted to keep, um, um, to, to have the first, session of questions and now but um so he needs to run as you as you have heard for his dikr juma so what we'll do is that we will continue with uh presenter three and presenter four and then we'll join all the questions and answers towards the end before we uh, move to that uh, i another announcement the third panel panel three will start at 10 15 and not at 10 as originally planned in the program. So we run with this panel towards until 10, we have a 15 minutes break, and then uh, at 10.15 panel, um, uh, the, 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 the next panel will start. Okay, thanks. So um, as I had announced before, our third presenter today is Sheikh Abdullahi uh, Nyang. Um, who uh, will present on uh, um, uh, the metamorphosis of leadership in the faida of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas. Bismillah. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I would like first to, to thank Professor Khan for his invitation to participate in a such important event which give us the opportunity to present some of the results of our ongoing research. This paper focused on the metamorphosis of leadership in the FEDO, starting from the Dakar context. It could be tied with Dakar capital of the FEDO or something like the Senegalese megalopolis and the new soldiers of Sheikh Ibrahim Yas. So this article is the result of uh, the socio-anthropological research that we have been conducting since January 2021 with a group of students from the Department of Sociology in University of Shahante Job. This work, which had a title um, that, I, that I mentioned, is um, starting from a corpus of 100 interviews and several dozen of not observation made to the disciples and spiritual guide established in Senegal. Capital of Senegal, the city of Dakar has become one of the major centers of influence of Faida Ibrahimia in West African sub-region. After long being perceived as the other people's field, a field for other religious community, the Senegalese capital has now become a field for the fight. This article aimed to examine the sociological mechanism that led to this fight from the late 1918 to the present day. This led us to formulate this hypothesis for the emergency of a new figure of religious guide, more anxious to follow the new mask of urban expression in terms of faith, meaning, and belonging. This coincidence between the fight that is shaping inside an urban space is recomposition is more major interest 
in the face of multiple social, economic, and cultural transformation, the car of opportunities for players concerned with me meeting the demands of performance and, and excellency, including major urban centers in the West African countries, have become places of experimentation. The appearance in the FIDA, new figures of religious leaders, religious leaders, and their orientation towards new targets come, in our opinion, to adhere to demands of the moment. The new leaders, the new leader figure, faculty, does not so much question the validity of all the figure, but capitalized resources from a renewed faculty to decipher new needs, new demands for meaning and desire for spiritual rootedness. Contrary to popular belief, things did not happen in a day. Three, several were successive, there, there were several successive waves, several attempts and several successive breakthroughs. The situation that prevails today is only the result of a long process of contact between Dakar and Fayyad. It is a religious history made up of multiple impressions and sequences enriched by different but complementary profiles. Thus, the redefinition of a religious offering, the accommodation towards the reality of big cities, including Dakar, Saint Louis, Chess, Rufis, become an issue for all religious communities. Due to its political, administrative, economic, and cultural position, Dakar is a land of choice for religious groups. Many of them are looking to establish themselves there to ensure a better base of influence in the country and outside the country. As an economic hub, Dakar region is also a place of social and cultural effervescency where all the components of society, Senegalese society rub shoulders. Dakar is Senegal in miniature. It includes all aspects and components of the country all ethnic groups, all social strata, all affiliation, all religious movement of Senegalese society are present. Dakar is a place where contemporary socio-cultural dynamics of world country are experiencing. A hotbed of youth struggling with multiple references. Dakar is a melting pot of court and logic of emancipation for a country where seven percent of the population are under 35. Dakar is the heart of the Senegal New Deal, where demands and new demands are not limited to politics and economics, but they find expression even in the relationship with God and this, his intermediary on, on earth. Those who understand and anticipate an appropriate of can conquer a new authority in the agglomeration. The city of Dakar is swept by this wave of individualization that cross West Africa. As such, Dakar is also one of the African places where intergenerational demarcation is experienced. Many individuals escape inherited affiliation and imposed identity. As a result, it is not uncommon for a person to renounce previous family affiliation in order to adhere to a phase to integrate a new community, short to find new affinities more compatible with aspiration of individuals especially those who seek both the future and the face of God. And those who are anxious to reconnect with the religion and cultural heritage of the country. Also more and more young people are showing a desire to choose the religious guide that are right for them instead of being content remain in a family tradition or membership in, in a religious community. They aspire to place under the tutelage of new ones who understand them who share with them common concerns. This recodification of the space of faith, that of religious belonging and salvation seems to be a witness and advent of new orientation and new margin of action with regard to the imagination of oneself and the choice of, of the group of uh, belonging among individuals. From here, all the religious mobility that find it necessary to provide effective and appropriate religious guide in a urban context in full recomposition. Moreover, the establishment of FIDA in Dakar did not happen in one day. It is the result of a process. Overall, the relationship between Dakar and FIDA is part of a historical continuum that needs to be addressed now. 
The first contact between Dakar and the fighter date back to the time of Sheikh Ibrahim Yas. The two properties that Master of Fida had in Dakar attest largely to this. In addition to Nyas himself, some of his disciples reside in, da reside in Dakar, like Elijah Omar Khan, husband of Sheikh Maria Nyas, daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim. After Sheikh Ibrahim, his eldest son, Elijah Abdullah Ibrahim, son of, of eldest son of the time, engaged in a vast operation to maintain the gains. Elijah Abdullah Ibrahim, he, in his campaign of moral monitoring and reframing of conduct of the faithful, endorsed his certain element of the fighter living in Dakar. As a guardian of time, he made many calls to order to, to, to those who introduced dance, song, and ostentatious wearing of the rosary. Khalif Abdullah Ibrahim, in his effort to consolidate the fighter in Dakar, made the Ansar Din Federation an essential level. He encouraged all fighter supporters to join and buy the membership card. In any time, he enters his cadet, Sheikh Mahmoud Ibrahim Yas, with the task of coordinating Ansar Din's national activities, making Dakar a priority in the development of the fighter. Elijah Abdullah found a house in Sacred in 1918. In this perspective, he drove his brother and as a dignitary of Medina Bay, all of them began to attend Dakar on a regular basis. It is the acquisition of secondary residence in Dakar by some dignitary that will have a decisive effect in what we call the Dakarization trajectory of the fight. Khalif Elijah Abdullah Nyas, Sheikh Mahmoud Ibrahim and Sheikh Hassan Sisi followed in the footstep of the second broad in her second bout house in Castle. Following them are the grandson, nephews, and grand nephews of Sheikh Ibrahim and Gajit, the same dynamic. We can note the case of Sheikh Mustafa Hussein Rinyas at the low income housing in the late 1990, with the exception of Sheikh Mustafa, who settled permanently in Dakar in order to expand a network of Facebook. Sheikh Sheikh Mariam and who had founded a large school tree. Three other members of the Nyas family attending Dakar were satisfied with longer or shorter stay in the capital. Stays during which they transfer the time of their travel to Dakar, device already functional in color. Thus, they come with a succession of faithful and servants more or less interchangeable, which means that for the, for the most part, the ambition was not yet to settle in Dakar to lead a significant tangible offensive or for major implementation start strategy. Through their visit to the capital, the dignitary of Medina Bay have prepared the ground for future establishment. The success of the current leaders of the FIDA owes much to respectability and reputation of benevolence that dignitaries such as Elijah Abdullah Ibrahim, Sheikh Ahmed Dam Ibrahim, Ustaz Ibrahim Mahmoud Job were able to build. They work to give, the, to, give to the Dakar, Dakar citizens a positive image of the FIDA, an image that will benefit the next generation of leaders. It is therefore the previous constriction of a reputation and the shaping of a moral eminency and intellectual facilitate the subsequently breakthrough of a new category of leaders, visibly in line with current equation of the Senegalese capital. Elijah Abdullah Ibrahim, by his exemplary management of the ceremonies of the fighter, and especially the Ansar Din Federation, Sheikh Mahmoud by dedicating and his social action. Sheikh Nazir Nyas by his air of vegetation of Koran, which have moved more than one Senegalese, Sheikh Hassan Sise and Sheikh Ustaz Ibrahim Mahmoud Job by the lectures. This was the reconfiguration that the new leadership inherited in the mid and late 1990s and early 2000s. The present fortune of new Dakar's leader or the fighter does not fall ex nihilo. It follow a passion and discreet work carried out by the people of the family of Sheikh Ibrahim and their relatives. The 1990s with coincided with a rise in informal protests, student, women association, neighborhood youth, and informal rap groups, local resident movements, street vendors, and above all, new wave of inspiration, synonymous with a desire for social, political, and identity emancipation. In this atmosphere, most of the faith community understand to need to develop a way of action 
that could respond to the new situation and thus present themselves as a credible alternative. New forms of religious engagement were created. Reformist movement in the same way as the so-called reformist association. The Brotherhood movement produced new model of religious management as if they intend to show an ability to capture frustration, to take account of new demands and to propose a new model of religious engagement. There have been new arrangements that have been observed in movements such as uh, that the Mustashidin and that of Chantakun of Sheikh Bejitun, that of Modu Karambaki, and later among the new leaders of the faith such as such such as Sangu Barham Yai and Sheikh Mahmoud Isa, among others. These last two religious guides stand out among a long list of new leaders of the faith in Dakar. Between them, they focus the attention of all those who are interested in fire in Dakar. In the space of a few years, they have succeeded in forming networks of Facebook who make them essential personalities. These new leaders of the fire share a number of structural and symbolic elements with all these organizations that we mentioned earlier and which stand out for the proactive strategy in recruiting followers and making the urban space. Since the 1990s and perhaps shortly before, it is the issue of reinvented religious leadership that seems to be decisive in the various city of the country. Now religious movement is spared this transversal requirement and reinvent, reinvention of not only active and dynamic leadership, but leadership that is in line with the data and expectation of the present. The offer of leadership, especially new leadership, contribute to a willingness to respond to the political, social, economic, and cultural change at the moment. Even within the different religious community, the situation that requires, it seems to offer a diversification of the profiles of, profiles of leader, the context of pluralism, working to transform religious space into an arena, it then becomes vital for religious groups wishing to resist to propose leaders who are equal to aspiration, that is, leaders who are able to serve the new wave of request for religiosity. It is in this new physiognomy of religious leadership that guides such as Sheikh Mahmoud Isa and Baba Karijai, known as Sang Barham, appear, will appear. These two leaders. These two guides are from the region of Kaolak, the first from Nyoro and the second from Chakhu Chofyon. They all obtain um, ijazah from, the first one obtained ijazah from um, Sheikh Muhammad al-Hadi Ibrahim Yas, and the second one for uh, Sheikh al Bukhari of Mauritania. In the early 1980s, there were not as many followers of the fighter in Dakar as there are today. Certainly the Ansaruddin Federation was doing a coordinating and animating animation work there um, and that the figure of the Sheikh Ibrahim's family. In this case, Sheikh Amariam was already living in the capital, but still this presence remaining relatively timid. Towards the end of the 1918s, we note the, bro the break growth of some great Mokhadam who most distinguished were Sheikh Mukhtar Ka, Sheikh Bubusi, and Sheikh Ibrahim Sal from Gejoai, among others. Thus, the, the dynamic of the fighter begins to intensify with the significant contribution of figures like Sheikh Amariam, whose school institution Dar Quran participate in the visibility of the action of the family of Sheikh Ibrahim in Dakar. Next to Sheikh, to Sheikh, other women distinguish themselves very early. They are Ajalu Tujar and Yai, Aisha Mendi, and Seda Muskorme. On this Mohadam woman in Dakar, we will be Josephine wrapping of Fiti woman Islamic leader in the Sufi movement in Dakar. The new leaders have among other merits to have accelerated social integration within the fight in Dakar. During a great period, a good period, the Daira affiliate to Ansar Jain were mostly grouped with strong local encourage. That is to say, former to according, accord, according to the place of re residence, the ethnic group or, or the corporation. We've, Mahmoud Isa Job and Sangabarham Yai, the segmentation is no longer appropriate. The latter make sure to break the residential ethnic corporatist lock in favor of the entire where the common denominator remains the phase and the principle of distinction. 
remains the membership of the community of Sheikh Ibrahim. In this regard, Sheikh Mahmoud Isa prays it over the Jamia to Muhtasimi, those who climb, climb to the Khalid, to the cable, cable of Allah, a religious organization whose headquarters are in West Far, in, in Dakar. As for you have, you have about two minutes. Okay. As for Sangu Barham Jai, he directed the Jamia to Fujian Sitrin. On, on the home page of the latter organization, we can read a call to all being of the universe, a call to receive wisdom, a call to know the creator Allah. This, initiate, this organization initiated to Arabic language from, from people to know religion, to learn Quran and Hadith, and to learn um, the books of the Tijani in general and those of Fida in, in, in particular. The, the, while we often heard his followers, name him Qutb Zaman, Hall of Time. It was during an invitation. Um, um, now I'm talking about, I'm talking about Sangh Barham Jai. It was during the invitation to the program called uh, To Islam on GTV, a Senegalese television and broadcast on May um, 2018. That Sangh Jai, even in fact, publicly claiming it. This statement is very meaningful and will give rise to to many commands. The spiritual station of the Kudbaniya station is, if not the most important, at least one of the most important in Sufism because the food is perceived as the complete man, the one who solved the equation of time, the one whose cosmic identity is superior to that of other saints of the time. Uh, for the description of, of Ruhullahi that is attributed to the Sheikh Mam Isa is quite recent. Although he was never had to claim publicly this status of Ruhullah, these disciples attribute him this function, arguing that Sheikh Ibrahim himself accredited about the coming of Isa, Sayyidina Isa, by, by specifying, specifying that the latter uh, would be his own. Like the Mahdi, the Ruhullah embodies the aspiration of the follower and guide them towards the restoration of the purity of faith. It brings a truthful and unconverted leadership to all humanity, creating just a social order and a world free for oppression and ensure that the Islamic law is, is renowned. So because of the useful in the development of the development policy of the religious movement at the national level, it become more strategic to make them allies, partners, C7, that in, than enemies or elements to be banished. Sheikh Ibrahim's head seems to be aware of all the interests in forging privilege linked with these Dakar's leader, especially since they do not handle them and continue to recognize their authority. The allegiance of the family of Sheikh Ibrahim is never broken by these leaders, despite some punctual failures. We are obviously dealing with an arrangement based on a perspective of resonance, what Ertmut Rosa called resonance, instead of confrontation and, or, and mistrust. In reality, each segment seems to fit on the other insofar as it seems to prevail mutual need between each other. The heirloom, the heirloom guards needs these new leaders who ability to mobilize no longer need to, to be demonstrated. The competition in which they engage and get these new leaders to seek the support, proximity, and validation of the, the heirs of Sheikh Ibrahim Yass. As a result, the new ambitions revive the whole intra-community game in that they give rise to a redistribution of friendship and preferential link that blur the logic of century periphery segmentation. It is curious to see that this, uh, the reorganization has not yet given rise to matrimonial alliance between these new um, leaders in Dakar and um, the members of Sheikh Ibrahim's family. Either way, um, no one can go without other complementarity and interdependency. If the leaders of Dakar needs Medina Bay to find moral guarantee and to benefit from the prestige of the family of Sheikh Ibrahim, this new religious guide bring a new added value. The service they render to the community in terms of visibility is not neglected. The divide they create in Dakar are an important lever in catching up one implementation delay in Dakar. In, in Dakar that fired a heart compared to its other, com, com, uh, other counterparts. The concept of resonance, which is a musical metaphor, is about this rope that connects us to the world and sometimes vibrates. 
Uh, How is that? Please wrap up from China. Could you, could you wrap up, please? Can you wrap up? You were, you, you ran out of time. Thanks. Yeah, in, in fact, with the world, resonance is criterion of successful life, a way of being in relation with others in the world that integrates the emotional component. The resonance apply well to, to these new leaders of the Fido, who in their journey of success rely largely on a harmonious relationship with their own world, namely the central institution of the Fido, the family of shared brightness and the dignitary of the religious community. For them, this is where the good life is spent in the community of Melin of Facebook. They are also in resonance process because they testify to ability to listen and to respond to the world that is Dakar. It is demands uh, in its demands as in its multiple imperative in terms of return to faith and spiritual appeasement in resonance with the environment of the Fida in the Dakar city. At the same time, this religious guide find harmony with these people in collective, but with the teaching of Sheikh Ibrahim, who is a teacher. Thank you. I'll stop here thinking. Thanks, Thank you thanks a me. lot. Thanks a lot for another very rich presentation. Um, in this panel about the global spread of the FIDA, uh, we uh, are proceeding uh, following the direction, the, 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 the direction of the sun from east, Singapore, west. So we went from Singapore to Kerala and then to Dakar, and then we're moving to the United States. But in the next presentation uh, by Rasul Miller, we will learn that uh, the sun actually rises from the west. So perhaps we will have to start our panel again and do it the, in the reverse order. So Bismillah, uh, Rasul Miller will present on the sun rises from in the African, African west, west, New York, New York City, City, Black American, American Titanic. Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. You know, it's funny. I actually changed the name of it, but mashallah, I guess Allah wanted that to be the name <laughs> for today that, that it got introduced. So, alhamdulillah, Allah is perfect. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أطلق والخاتم لما أسبق ناشر الحق بذق الهدي إلى أشراتك المستقيم وعلى عليه حق قدر من الرعظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So first off, thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Khan for, you know, convening this and inviting me to be a part of it and I'm really honored to be on the stage with other esteemed panelists uh, Sidi Khalid I don't see you anymore but it's always a pleasure to be in your space um, I know time is short so I'm going to kind of just jump right into it um, so what I'm presenting today is a section from a chapter of the book that I'm currently working on the book looks at the history of black orthodox Muslim or Sunni Muslim uh, movements and, and communities in New York City, in and around New York City. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it looks at these um, movements in and around New York City. And um, I, one of the themes that animates sort of the entire book is the relationship between these communities and Muslims on the African continent, right? So going all the way back to the 1920s, you have black American Muslims. And when I say black American, I'm including both African American and Afro Caribbean. American folks who are in areas, urban places like New York City, um, one of the things that sort of animates their interest in Islam is this this pervading or, or prevailing um, sort of understanding of the relationship between Islam and Africa, right? This Atlantic world sort of encounter and the way Islam kind of connects them to the African continent. I hope that makes sense. I'm being very truncated just to try to <laughs> uh, not go over time. But in any case, this particular chapter looks at the emergence in the 1970s of communities of black American Muslims who are engaged with African Sufi Turuq, right? African Sufi orders or Sufi orders that are sort of headquartered on the African continent. Um, and I look at two in the chapter. I look at the emergence of the Burhaniya order, which is in a, a tariqa that, had, that is sort of headquartered in Sudan. And of course, the, the Fayda Tijaniya in Senegal. And these, I focus on these two because they're sort of the first and the largest, um, the Tijaniya being the largest. Um, but uh, certainly after the period that I look at, others emerge, right? So now if you go to New York City, you have Zawi is affiliated with the Muradiya, you have the Mukashfi Tariqa, also based in Sudan and whatnot. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the section that deals with the emergence of the Tijaniya. Um, 
So a convergence of factors sort of led black American Muslims to join these communities. Virtually all of the, and, and a big part of my method is oral history. So I interviewed a number of the founders um, and just community members of the Jamaat al in New York City. Um, virtually all of the members of these communities that I spoke with were moved by the opportunity to learn Islam from African scholars who shared their racial identity and facilitated a connection to Africa's rich history of Islamic learning. In addition, they found in Sufism an expression of Islam that was for them uniquely spiritual, spiritually fulfilling. Also in New York City and in the U.S. writ large, you have uh, some other Sufi movements affiliated with other, other personalities um, that um, were sort of resonant with often white Muslims, white converts um, that had kind of a more universalist approach to religion. But in the case of the orders that uh, attracted black American Muslims like the Tijaniya, the Burhaniya, they tended to uh, have a very orthodox sort of interpretation of Tasawwuf, meaning that they, they, they were people who came from orthodox or Sunni Muslim communities to begin with. And for them, their Sufi affiliations were quite compatible with their notions of Islamic orthodoxy. Um, and they saw it being sort of necessary to be a Muslim, right, to be a Sufi. Um, so uh, as a result of that, I, I say a third factor, um, in addition to the, the racial identity and the connection to Africa, um, uh, a third factor that was articulated by a significant number of the community members I spoke with was their perception that the religious practice of the African Sufi Muslim shuyukh that they encountered most closely resembled the Islamic prophetic ideal, providing a model and a pathway for a fuller realization of their own Islamic identities. Right. So I'm looking at sort of the socio-political and the religious motivations that led people to join uh, the tariqa. Um, what further facilitated the appearance of black American Sufi communities, as I'm calling them here, during this specific historical moment was the emergence of Muslim clerical communities on the African continent willing to collaborate with black American Muslims based on their shared religious identity, resulting in transatlantic partnerships. So going all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s, you have individual African Muslim immigrants in places like Harlem and Brooklyn and Detroit who are engaging black American Muslims um, and, and certainly sort of impacting the evolution of Islam in New York City. Um, but it's sort of it just individual immigrants. Right. So one of the things that happens in the 70s is you have someone like Sheikh Hassan Sisi, who uh, is, you know, the leader of a community in Senegal who's willing to open his doors to black American Muslims who want to come, who want to send their children and study things like this. So this results in a kind of transatlantic partnership where there's this sustained exchange. Um, and this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm arguing is a bit is a bit new, is a bit different than what's happening in an earlier period. Um, and uh, I have a, a, a section where I kind of frame this history. Uh, I call it a flood across the Atlantic. Um, um, and basically what um, I, I, I frame it as two oceans meeting, right? The sort of common Sufi refrain of two oceans meeting. Normally when you hear about that, you think about two shiur who are sort of oceans within people that are meeting. But what I'm talking about is really these two Atlantic world traditions. So I'll read a little bit from this section. Sheikh Hassan Sisi's first visit to New York City in 1976. This is the first time Sheikh Hassan Sisi, the grandson of Sheikh Ibrahim Yas, who came to New York City and introduced the Tijani order to folks in New York and then later to other parts of the country. Uh, this meeting prompted an encounter between two distinct yet interconnected Atlantic world Muslim traditions. Sheikh Hassan's family name uh, inherited from his father Sidi Aliou Sisi invoked a millennium old West African Muslim heritage. The Sisi lineage historically associated with Islamic learning, proselytization, and mastery of the supernatural can be traced at least as far back as the 11th century when a ruler of ancient Ghana converted to the Muslim faith. Um, and of course, Sheikh Hassan's mother, uh, Sayyid Fatima Zahra Nias, was also a religious scholar and the eldest daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. Um, and so here you have Sheikh Hassan, uh, who would also go on to achieve global recognition in his own right as both a Muslim scholar and humanitarian, was certainly a prominent representative of West African Islamic scholarship and history. Um, in a broad sense. The other Atlantic world Islamic tradition involved in this encounter is that of enslaved African Muslims in the Americas and their descendants. 
Much of the literature on Islam in the West bears testament to the contribution of Muslims to resistance movements of people of African descent who challenged the mechanisms of transatlantic slavery, American settler colonialism, Western imperialism, and white supremacy. These African descended Muslim women and men, racialized as black, occupy a central position in what Cedric Robinson has termed the black radical tradition. This is a, a, a sort of theorist of, of um, you know, this, this kind of tradition of black radicalism, which he asserts has its roots in truth in the resistance movements that emerged on the African continent against the backdrop of roughly 400 years of transatlantic slavery and European imperialism. As recounted in the preceding chapters, which you of course have not yet read, uh, knowledge of this history informed and influenced those black Americans who embraced Islam over the course of the 20th century in various ways. Indeed, for many black American Orthodox Muslims or Sunni Muslims, Islam provided a means to engage the historical legacies of pre-colonial African societies and, in some cases, anti-colonial movements. For his part, Sheikh Hassan Sisi demonstrated a keen interest in the history, struggles, and cultural productions of black Americans. His American students and admirers found him willing and able to discuss the history of Harlem, the spirituality and music of John Coltrane, the political consciousness of James Brown, the far-reaching impact of white supremacy and transatlantic slavery, and a host of other topics that were of interest to black Americans in the 1970s, and he was able to discuss these topics with a remarkable degree of understanding and fluency. Members of his community back home in Senegal even commented on his interest and investment in black American communities, and not always in a celebratory manner. The emergence of the black American contingent of the Jamaat al Faida thus represents a meeting of two traditions of Islam in the Atlantic world. Of course, these two vast religious and intellectual currents were historically linked through the shared African ancestry of West African Muslims and their descendants who maintained or embraced Islam in the Americas after their enslavement and through their shared resistance to white and European domination. Nevertheless, they were molded by the vastly different contexts that characterized West Africa and the Americas respectively. Beginning in the 1970s, these two traditions embodied by black American Muslims on the one hand and West African immigrant Muslims uh, and continental African Muslim scholars on the other mixed to create something new. Okay, so that's kind of a long sort of introduction to kind of frame the history that I want to sort of kind of introduce us to today. Um, and so the way I proceed with the chapter is I highlight the stories of a few pioneers from the community of the Feda in New York City. Um, obviously, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them, but I'm going to select a, a few uh, just to give you an idea of how I'm going about sort of restructuring this history. And let me say this. I should have said this at the beginning. This is very much a work in progress. So I certainly invite folks who may be in the audience who may have lived part of this history to, you know, correct me, you know, if, if or, 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 you know, help me flesh out the historical record if there's anything that you find uh, my recount to be missing. Um, so when Sheikh Hassan Sisi uh, came in 1976, his visit was facilitated by, and this was again the first time that Sheikh Hassan visited the U.S. was in 1976. This visit was facilitated by a network of Muslims who immigrated to New York City from the West African nation of Ghana, which enjoys a significant Tijani presence during the 1960s and 70s. In the wake of the Hart Seller Act of 1965, this is a change in U.S. immigration policy. In the wake of that act, immigrant enclaves developed throughout New York City where South Asian and Arab Muslims coalesced, impeding the racial and ethnic diversity that largely characterized the places of worship that black American Muslims had helped to build. So before that time, you have really multi-ethnic communities that black American Muslims are leading in New York City. But after 1965, some of that unity breaks down, right? And that has to do with the nature of who's immigrating after 1965, different kinds of class dynamics and whatnot. However, it also resulted in the extension of new West African immigrant diasporas into the city. Not surprisingly, these black Muslim immigrants from the African continent were often more likely to relocate to majority black neighborhoods like Harlem or Bed-Stuy than their South Asian and Arab counterparts. In keeping with the national trend, the first West African immigrants to arrive in New York City after 1965 tended to be from Anglophone countries like Ghana and Nigeria. Immigrants from Francophone countries like Senegal, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire were more represented in later waves of migration to the city that occurred during the 1980s and 90s. By the mid-1970s, more than a dozen or so Ghanaian Tijani families, members of Sheikh Ibrahim's Jamaat al Faida, had settled in different parts of the city, being intimately connected to the West African Tijani networks that linked communities of the Faida throughout the region. These Ghanaian Tijanis were well aware of Sheikh Ibrahim's uh, grandson, 
who had extension, extensive religious training and was uh, in the process of obtain, obtaining an advanced degree in London. So, in other words, these Ghanaian Tijanis, they knew about Sheikh Hassan, uh, even though this was before Sheikh Hassan sort of emerged as a, as a, a leader on the world stage. Um, Yusuf Anan, a Tijani from Ghana living in Staten Island, who worked at the United Nations, wrote a letter inviting Sheikh Hassan to the U.S., thereby helping him to attain, attain the necessary travel visa. Now, during this first visit, Sheikh Hassan was slated to stay in Staten Island and ended up staying at the home of another Ghanaian community member named Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson and his wife, Haja Halima Dimson, in the South Bronx. This change ended up being rather fortuitous for the future of the Feda in New York City. Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson uh, was born around 1940, so this is the first kind of uh, personality that I'm sort of chronicling in the section. Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson was born around 1940 in the northern region of Ghana. He converted to Islam around the age of 18. He achieved notoriety in Ghana as a long distance runner. After embracing Islam, the somewhat boisterous young athlete would visit the national mosque in Ghana's capital of Accra, attracting attention for riding his loud motorcycle to the Friday prayer. One day after the prayer, Dimson sped away on his motorcycle and began experiencing stomach pain while riding causing him to lose control of the bike and crash into a ditch. An elder from the mosque, uh, who was also a religious instructor and a notable muqaddam of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz in Accra, rode by in his car and noticed the bike, recognizing it as the one belonging to the young athlete. Upon inspection, he found uh, Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson uh, and assisted him. This served as the beginning of a lifelong relationship between the two men. The elder, whose name was Ustad Muhammad Anan, who's uh, a, a, a muqaddam from Ghana with a really amazing story in his own right that we don't have that we don't have time to get into now, but I encourage people to look into it. He became Ahmed Dimson's teacher and facilitated his entry into the Tijani Tariqa, ultimately introducing him to Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas during one of the Sheikh's visits to Ghana. Uh, Dimson became a frequent visitor to the town of Medina Ba, traveling to the Senegalese Tijani hub as often as a half as often as a half a dozen times a year. Um, and I, I'd love to read this quote, but I'll just kind of describe it quickly. Um, I interviewed uh, Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson's son, Ibrahim Dimson, who is a really a pillar in the community today. Um, and he, he he mentioned to me that, you know, his uh, his father got the suggestion to go to America from Sheikh Ibrahim, saying that he had some, some work to do there. And he said his father didn't really know what he meant. He thought he meant work as in work to make money. But, you know, he, he, he now, you know, kind of... Uh, um, suspects that Sheikh Ibrahim really had a sense that this English speaker from Ghana who had the kind of personality and charisma that Al-Haji Ahmed Dimson had would play a key role in establishing the Feda in New York City. Um, and I'll read this actual, I'll, I'll read this section from my interview with, um, with Sidi Ibrahim Dimson. He said, my father made an effort to become really good friends with the African Americans in those days, specifically the African American Muslims. I asked, why do you think that was? And he said, my father was a Talib of Sheikh Ibrahim, and his understanding was to spread Islam, spread the Fayda, uh, spread the Tariqa, and that wasn't exclusive to just one group of people. He saw a greatness in the African-American Muslim community. He saw sincerity. He saw a lot of wonderful things. And for that reason, he became dedicated to helping spread the Tariqa amongst the African-Americans. He loved the African-Americans, and he understood that African-Americans were just family members that had been separated from their homeland. He was really excited about introducing them to this thing called Tariqa. I asked, would you say your father embraced a sort of Pan-African kind of sentiment? He said, yeah, I think so, definitely. In those days, I think it was a Pan-African sentiment, but with a twist. It wasn't just come on back to Africa just because. It was come on back to Africa to come and meet this man who was freeing people from themselves and from shaitan and from the misery of the world by giving them the opportunity to know themselves and their Lord. So Ibrahim Dimson's reflections of his father's religious and socio-political perspectives is revealing. He asserts that in his father's view, African-Americans were, quote, family members that had been separated from their homeland, invoking notions of African diasporic connectivity. He also describes his father's interest in promoting his vision of Islam, which, quote, wasn't exclusive to just one group of people. This simultaneous investment in cultivating African diasporic racial solidarity between West Africans and Black Americans, as well as rather universalist a rather universalist approach to Islam, meaning one that wasn't for a particular ethnic group. Uh, in many ways, the religious this religious orientation characterized what I'm calling in the book Black Muslim cosmopolitanism. 
Um, so in other words, black American Orthodox Muslims, like those who attended the communities in New York City that existed in 1940s, 50s, and 60s, um, and 70s, they adopted a religious, cultural, and social political orientation equally informed by various expressions of black internationalism and Orthodox Islam. So this is a kind of major intervention of, of the book. Um, a lot of the literature kind of depicts a situation where, you know, Islam, a sort of Orthodox Islam was at odds with the kind of, you know, black nationalists or internationalist politics. And part of what I'm arguing is that for these communities, the two were very much intertwined. And so in their meeting with African Muslims who had a similar disposition, you know, like people like uh, El Haji Ahmed Dimson, who was a follower of Sheikh Ibrahim, this pan-African Orthodox Muslim scholar, um, this likely served as an affirmation of the compatibility of these ideas and by extension the, the legitimacy of these black American Muslims' own religious articulations. El Haji Ahmed Dimson, his wife Halima Dimson and their family, they hosted Sheikh Hassan during his frequent extended visits to New York City from 1976 to 1982. El Haji Ahmed Dimson invited some of his black American Muslim friends to meet the Sheikh and they in turn invited others. Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Can we can we make it three? <laughs> now I try to keep it I can try to keep it brief, inshallah. In turn, these black American Muslims facilitated a growing awareness of the Sheikh Historica and contemporary West African Islamic scholarship broadly. In this manner, Al Haji Ahmed Dimson, as well as other Ghanaian Tijanis living in New York City at the time, played a vital role in laying the foundation for the Feda in the US. So I only have two minutes. Um, I'll just briefly say, um, well, I'll read this section quickly. During the late 1970s and early 80s, dozens of black American Muslims in New York City and their families, including African American and Afro-Caribbean Muslim women and men, joined the Tijani Tariqa and took Sheikh Hassan as their spiritual guide. They came from virtually every Muslim community in the city that enjoyed significant black American participation. And while some were upwardly mobile black professionals, the majority of them came from working class backgrounds. The same occurred in Detroit and Chicago, which Sheikh Hassan also frequently visited during this time, and eventually in other U major U.S. cities like Atlanta, Cleveland, Memphis, and Washington, D.C. as well. Two of them, Haji Karima Abdul Karim and Imam Saeed Abdul Salam, both of whom met Sheikh Hassan through their relationships with Ghanaian Muslims during his early visits, stand out both for their early embrace of the Sheikh's leadership and their role in influencing others to do the same. So I'll try to just briefly kind of summarize what I wanted to read in the sections about Haji Karim Abdul Karim and Imam Saeed Abdul Salam, anhu, may Allah be pleased with our Imam. Um, so these were two sort of pillars in the black American Orthodox Muslim community. Imam Saeed had been a founder of what is actually the oldest Sunni mosque in Harlem, which was founded by followers of Malcolm X when they left the Nation of Islam. Haji Karima was a pioneer in, in sort of organizing with other uh, Muslim women um, to create an, uh, you know, programming to help promote Islam, introduce Islam, and also to help just serve the community. Um, both of them had traveled. Haji Karima, uh, about a year after she became Muslim in 1969, or a couple of years after she became Muslim, her and her family moved to, uh, to travel to Ghana. Um, and in Ghana, um, they, uh, you know, the, the family friend who introduced them was a member of the Feda and took them to a number of homes of other Ghanaian Muslims. And this is where she heard the Wazifa, right? So this is the early 1970s. She was exposed to the Wazifa, exposed to the Feda tradition, Islam in Africa. And this touched her. And later when Sheikh Hassan came to visit, some of his Ghanaian Talibais um, asked her to invite some of her friends to come and meet the Sheikh. Another meeting occurred at El Haji Ahmed Dimson's house where he invited one of his African-American Muslim friends um, who happened to be Imam Saeed Abdul Salam. And Imam Saeed Abdul Salam uh, actually was the, the first to take the tariqa, right? And also became the first muqaddam of Sheikh Hassan in the United States. So I hate that I'm not able to tell you a little bit more about these two sort of pillars and the pioneering members of the community. But the main takeaway that I wanted you to get from it is that these were people who were respected in their own communities for the work they had done prior and who had this kind of... Um, you know, had this kind of not only religious but pre but but socio political perspective, this African diaspora connection, which led them to embrace the Tariqa, and because of their own sort of efforts and abilities, they became sort of waves by which the flood was able to spread. And um, I want to read one quick last paragraph um, describing um, the the first. Um, African-American Muslims to actually journey to Medina Bay. So in the late 1970s, Imam Saeed and his wife, Sister Selwa, 
who was another you know pioneering member of the community who um, I didn't get the opportunity to met. She passed away before I, I, I you know before I came on the scene, but we we prayed a lot of water for her efforts as well. They traveled to Medina by Senegal, um, and while they were there, Haji Karima also visited for about a day. Another Black American Orthodox Muslim from Detroit named Bilal Muhammad Farouk was also in Medina Bay during the same period. Um, folks that I talked to in Detroit say he was actually the first American to travel to Medina Bay, so he was kind of already there with his wife and his son. Um, uh, these four black American Orthodox Muslims were not only the first to visit this West African Tijani hub, Medina Bay, but also the first to meet Sheikh Hassan's father, Sheikh al Haj Sidi Ali Sisi, who was Sheikh Ibrahim's closest student and successor. Upon returning to the U.S., all four served as pathways by which the Feda expanded further. Imam Saeed, now the first American to receive an ijazah from Sidi Ali Sisi, continued to introduce others to the Tariqa in New York, along with the support of Sister Sawa. Many of those who joined the order became, came from the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, which he was a founder of, which he had helped to build. Muqaddam Bilal, the only other American with an ijazah from Sidi Ali Sisi, helped to spread the order in Detroit, which went on to, to boast one of the largest and most visible Tijani communities in the U.S. Haji Karima continued to support Sheikh Hassan's efforts to build ties with the black American Muslim community, including in cities like Cleveland and Chicago, where she assisted Sheikh Hassan in enrolling in a Ph.D. program at Northwestern University. After the Sheikh was appointed the Imam of the Grand Mosque in Medina Bay, necessitating his withdrawal from the doctoral program, Haji Karima played a vital role in the conception and creation of the African American Islamic Institute, Quran School, a school Sheikh Hassan established to provide religious instruction for black American Muslim children. Um, and so this school went on to educate, you know, hundreds of black American Muslim children, mostly from working class backgrounds um, and, and also produced um, probably a, a, a fair number of, of who files of Quran. Um, from my understanding, it's the institution that's produced more African-American who files of Quran than any other institution in the world. And I'll end by mentioning that Haji Karima's daughter, Amina Abdul Karim Nyas, went on to graduate from the school, becoming the first woman from the U.S. that memorized the Quran in its entirety. So I apologize for having to rush through some of that, but I hope, you know, that kind of at least introduces folks to the story by which of how the Feda kind of established itself in New York and, and by extension in the rest of the country. And, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing some feedback and some questions, inshallah. Thanks a lot. So we have um, had a very rich panel. Uh, we have uh, listened to the development uh, and the spread of the Fayda Tijaniya uh, in fairly recent times, because the Dakar example also um, is, a, is a relatively recent expansion. And the floor is open for questions now to any of our four readers, uh, presenters, whom I um, invite to uh, turn their videos on. I can see that some of them are on, some are not. Could you please um, um, raise your ha hands for questions or comments, uh, or you could alternatively uh, type them in the uh, chat and I'll read them for you. Well, if we can ask questions of each other while hopefully other people are getting their questions together. I had a question for uh, Brother Suhail. Um, uh, I, so I didn't know anything about this history, really, so I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm curious to know, so the, the scholar that you mentioned who's sort of the first to kind of introduce, you know, just kind of an awareness of the Tariqa, quoting Sheikh Umar Futi, um, was uh, connected to the um, sort of uh, Barelvi tradition, correct? Yes, yes, yes. He was, yes, was a direct, direct student of Ambarel. Mm -hmm. so, so was the reception of the Tariqa um, sort of warmer among people from that tradition than, than others, or did that sort of not necessarily play, play a role? Actually, um, the Tariqa is spread after his demise. Uh, he died in 1950s. The Tariqa came in 2000s. So I was just referring to some of his uh, fatwas where he quoted Imam Marfoti. So the resistance, the resistance was, was uh, because uh, Kerala is very different uh, compared to the Barelvi traditions in uh, other part of India. Kerala is mostly uh, not Barelvi, not Duyubanti. It is like uh, taking a middle stance. In some matters, especially uh, matters regarding to Tariqa, they are mostly inclined towards Doyubandi. 
and uh, practicing the rituals of Sufism, they are inclined towards uh, Baralbi. So, uh, so we had some harsh uh, resistance from these scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I would also. Is there any hands raised? Someone has asked for the title of uh, Rasul Miller's book forthcoming, and I'm typing it in the chat for you. Um, if there's no questions from the audience, I would like to ask uh, Khalid Ajmain. Uh, we've heard about resistance from other established Sufi orders in another Asian country to the um, spread of the Tijaniya. And this has often been the case um, in the prior history of the Tariqa as well. Uh, from your presentation, we get a sense that things were smooth in Singapore. Um, is it true, or were you just giving you know the the the, the um, <laughs> uh, easy part of the story? Uh, in Indonesia, when they first arrived, they were rejected uh, mm. by all the tariqa, and later on, they were accepted by the ulama association there. But in Singapore, uh, uh, I think we followed the advice of Shemahi very carefully. And uh, Sheikh Mahi, he said that uh, make this tariqa as your personal journey. And uh, not to say things that is unnecessary in public. Mm. And uh, we are very small. And our Muslim community in Singapore is very small. So uh, we engage with each other. We build bridges with each other. And if they are interested, then only, you know, as a mukaddam of Sheikh Mahi, Usually, I will tell them all the conditions. But she always said that assimilate with the community. He ever said that even if you, uh, if you, even you have become a Tijani, do not cut yourself out from your community. Do your service with them, work with them. So we work on this basis, more of a khidma to the community. And uh, there was no issue, actually, as time goes by. I think a lot of people know we are Tijani. Of course, there might be some people who disagree, but there's no hostility uh, or going around and chasing after us. After us, No, I think uh, that's how Singapore is also, actually. We are very peaceful and we live in harmony. Uh, we even uh, interfaith and interculture uh, and so on. So we follow his advice. Right to make it as a personal journey, and who whoever is interested, then we will bring them a step forward, introducing the conditions and so on. So she always said that don't dawa to the tariqa and talk about anything else, right? And make them realize that tariqa is a personal journey, is your longing for Allah, and and this is one of the reason it revolutionized. Uh, our community through the young people, activism. Because that's why they feel the need to have Sufism, la learn Sufi path, walking on it. Uh, yeah, so we don't have uh, issues of uh, people against us. But of course, there are those who, like, you know, they say, oh, it's too difficult to, to, to not to have, to visit all Aulia non Tijani, you know, that kind of thing. That's all we had. Uh, but do we have like what I think uh, Brother Sohail was saying about his experience? So I think it's a different uh, culture and we work on that basis. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. And there's another question coming from the audience. It's also from for Khalid. Uh, the question is what was the prof? Uh, and sorry, the question is from Oludamini Ogunaike. And he's asking what was the process? by which the Tijaniya eventually became accepted by Nahdatul Ulama in Indonesia, if it was originally rejected. And how is the situation in Malaysia and Indonesia different the, from that in Singapore? I think in Indonesia, it takes time. And I think because they look at Nahdatul Ulama, before I, I jump in further, <laughs> Nahdatul Ulama is uh, Ali Sunnah Wan Jamaah scholars. Uh, now they become a political party in Indonesia. But before that, they also established a Tarika Association, where it's an umbrella organization for all Tarika in Indonesia. So before that, they were rejected because of the condition. And one or two Tarika 
uh, I don't want to mention the Tashika. In Indonesia, they rejected the Tijani also because of our strong affiliation with uh, Ibn Arabi, Wahlatu Wujud, and so on. Because some of them disagree. But the ulama came together with the consensus uh, in 19, if I'm not wrong, 1920s plus. And they agreed that the Tijani is Ahlu Sunnah Wan Jama'ah. There's nothing wrong with it. And they are all accepted. So the second conference by another two ulama in the 30s, they accepted it again until today. So Alhamdulillah. So they, they regard Tarika Tijani as a reputable Tarika based on Quran and Hadith, right? But there are many Tarika who are also equally controversy or controversial, I would say, in this region. There's like Awrat Muhammadiyah and so on, where they believe their Shia is Imam Mahdi. So it's argument in on that basis. But for Tijani, alhamdulillah, we had, they had no issues after that, after the explanation and so on. In Malaysia, uh, in the earlier days, they had no problem like in Indonesia, they were they were they were fine because the scholars that brought in uh, the Tarika Tijani in Malaysia, as I mentioned just now, from Banten, uh, later on he became close with the ruler of Johor. Johor is one of the state in Malaysia at that period of time. So they were the one who fought against colonialism and the communists. Yeah. So they were very close yeah. with the, the, the ruler, the Sultan. So we are now two minutes beyond. Uh, the time so, yeah. so, but in Singapore, it's different because we, uh, as I mentioned, we minority compared to uh, Indonesia and Malaysia as Muslim. So our way is slightly different. But Abila, through Faida and Tarbia, uh, the Tarika move around in many ways or social illness, mental health, and a lot of things deal with society issues. And that's how a lot of people accept this Tarika in in a unique manner, I would say. And later on, they experienced all this in Tarika that we, yesterday, all the scholars had explained. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, we have another question, but unfortunately, we cannot take it. Uh, take note that there's a question from Amira. I hope she will have a chance to ask her question later. Most of the speakers will be, will be here. We need, unfortunately, to cut now because the next session is starting in uh, uh, about 12 minutes. Uh, sorry, Amira, for that. Um, so we thank once again um, our panelists and we meet again in about uh, 12 minutes from now. Thanks to all and thanks for the, for the public. For, yes, for thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Bagaglia. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Everyone. Everyone.